So anyway, she moved to California so she could spend time with her uh, son and grandchild. And she has a daughter here and a grandson, Gavin, whom I baptized 23 years ago and actually married his parents. And she's trying to get back because he's in intensive care and flights are canceled. The airfares are like nuts and there's not that many flights. And, and so in talking to Connie, she said, you know what's holding me together? It's your church. Actually, she said it's our church because she never stopped supporting us. And she put a little thing in Facebook a couple days ago about updating people about how Gavin was doing, asking for prayers. And I was just, I guess I wasn't surprised by the number of people in our church who responded to her and had those praying hands and everything on Facebook. And she said, Don, would you please let the people know that is what is holding me together. And I went to visit her son and his girlfriend of four years and his mom who are just, you know, they just don't know what to do. And they said, you know, uh, even though we haven't been coming to church, those prayers are what holds us together. Make me realize more and more that the power of prayer is not about the results. Because we, we all pray for stuff. Every single day, I'm sure, silently or out loud, you pray for something. And maybe you pray for something to happen. And a lot of the stuff that we pray for doesn't happen. But that's not the way God answers prayer. Without saying a word, God answers by keeping our soul strong and our spirit intact and giving us the strength to take one step at a time for each day. The power of prayer is in the connection, knowing that you don't face your journey alone. We have each other. We have the good Lord. Yeah, I, I, there's so much going on in the world. Um, it's really, it, it can be really depressing at times. And uh, the other day, we're, um, a couple guys came to the church to fix something. And uh, just came because they wanted to fix it. And so afterwards, they're having a cup of coffee at the, the round table. And I, we just sat there and we talked. And we talked about Ukraine and the flooding in Kentucky and the violence and all that kind of stuff. And they basically said, hey, the world's a mess. And I got up and started walking my office. And I turned around. And I said, wait a second. There's something that is not a mess. And that's you two. And what we're talking about right now. Two people coming to the church, just doing something because they care about the church, talking, being a friend, having a moment, that moment of grace and goodness, that is what isn't a mess. And we can't lose sight of those ordinary moments of joy when people come together and just do something. It may be small, but if there's just one little act, it's amazing. That is what keeps us going. Just a moment or two when the spirit of love and friendship gives us the strength to face the rest of the day. The last couple of weeks, I've been on the receiving end of your prayers. You know, my uh, son Aaron was diagnosed with cancer and he started his treatments. And uh, I can't tell you what it means when you put something on Facebook or you give me a call or you just say, how's Aaron? because I realized that that's what we are about. And he's a warrior and he's gonna do fine, but when you are in the middle of a group that believes in the silent power of prayer, it really, really makes a difference. And it makes a difference to him, to his wife, to his kids. You know, the last two plus years, I've probably wondered and doubted and been confused more than I ever have in my life. And there's plenty to worry about. You know, I worry about myself and my family and I work at the church and all that kind of stuff and sometimes it can just get you down. And every day the mail comes and of course I, I look for money. No, I, I, and uh, so Kathy puts something on my desk with a note on the envelope saying, before you look at the check, please read the letter. And do you, do you have people in your life that just drive you nuts? You know, people that just, uh, they talk and you wonder where they're coming from. And Well, anyway, um, there's a lady who, I did her mother's funeral in the year 2013. So that's been about nine years ago. And uh, she doesn't have much. And I did her mom's funeral. And when she died, there was something said about there could be a lawsuit for some kind of whatever it is. Well, a letter came in the mail and it was on my desk, and I opened the letter, and it was from this lady. 
who drove me nuts. And she said, in the year 2013, you opened your church up to us, and you did my mom's funeral, and I made a promise to my mom when she died that if any money came about from the, her death, that I would share the money with some charitable organizations. Well, that's nine years ago. And why would you even remember what happened nine years ago? Well, she must have got something, and she sent a little note, and she said, I want to fulfill my promise. And she, in there was a check for $1,500. And nobody could probably use the $1,500 more than her. But she made a promise, and she kept that promise. And I thought to myself, Don, that's why we're here. Knock off the doubting stuff. Knock off the worrying stuff. That's why we're here. And that's the only thing we'd ever do that makes a difference. So I was reading the uh, passage for, from Colossians today, where it says, you are the people of God. And you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. If we are really followers of Jesus, if we claim to be Christian, and a lot of people do, then we need to take those words and put them into action. Compassion and kindness and gentleness, humility and patience. When we go out into the world to take care of the people we love, to go to work, as hard as it may be, if we are a follower of Jesus, we have to take those virtues and put them into practice, even if it doesn't always work. And then I think of the parable of the rich man. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like that. You know, I like to just get stuff and save it so I can use it later if I need it. So, but then when you cross the finish line and you leave behind lots of stuff, who's going to get it? People are going to fight over it. People who don't need it are going to get it. What's going to happen to all my All Saints t-shirts and hats that I've made over the past 48 years? <laughs> who's going to get those? I remember when I got accepted to the seminary, and it wasn't that expensive. I got my first invoice for tuition, and it was Mark Paid. And I said, that's my dad again, meddling in my business. <laughs> and so I talked to my dad, and I said, Dad, I, I went through college and everything. I'm in seminary now. You don't have to do this. And he looks, Don, I cannot take it with me. And I said, well, Dad, you got to save some egg money for yourself. And my dad said, Don, nah, you don't save egg money. You give it away. Then I said, well, what happens when it's gone? And he said, egg money is never gone. It never runs dry. And I realized more and more, Jesus makes more sense to me every single day. Amen. If you're able to, please rise for the